All right, Ryan, today is actually our favorite holiday. Giving Tuesday. I love, I love how they have, uh, well, I think, a, hold on, hold on. A, after everyone is like, you know, gets soiled with guilt from going out and overspending over the weekend with Black Friday and Cyber Monday, it's like you can, you can rinse yourself clean. Yeah, and there's also small Giving bus- Tuesday. There's small business Saturday that just happened. Oh, and that's cool too. I, I, I dig that, but it really combines two of your favorite things, giving and Tuesdays. <laughs> why, do, why, do I love, why do I love Tuesdays? I don't so know why much. you love Tuesdays. You're the one that loves Tuesdays so much. The world will never know. Yeah, but it's, uh, it's Giving Tuesday, and we had a special guest on this episode of the podcast. His name's Scott Harrison. He started a great nonprofit called Charity Water. And you, for those of you who've been with us for a while, you know that we've worked with them to build a bunch of uh, clean water wells in different countries throughout the world. And thank you for the folks who have helped us out in the past. We've been working with them for over five years now. And uh, we're doing something new with them. They, they just launched a new project, and you'll hear Scott talk about it. But if you're interested in contributing, even five bucks, if you're saying, I'm looking for a way to contribute beyond myself, today is Giving Tuesday. Let me help some folks who are truly in need because there are so many people who don't even have access to clean water in the world. You can head on over to charitywater.com org slash the minimalists you can see this great video that scott put together and we re- really encourage you to, to give whatever you can give even if it's a few bucks i know it may not seem like it's a whole lot but it, it certainly helps and especially with the size of our audience if all of you were to contribute something we would do something really special in this world i won't belabor it too much because scott does a much more eloquent job of describing what they do and what their mission is so let's go ahead and dive into this episode oh and we answer a bunch of questions as well this was a live event it's our first ever event in Brooklyn, New York, and we had three stops in New York, and he he joined us for that. He helped us answer some questions as well, and man, is he he's a brilliant guy. All right, y'all. Enjoy the show. We demand it. <laughs> Leave that in. Leave that in. That's so good. That's so good. <laughs> Leave that in. <laughs> All right. Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing that's just feeding your greed Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it Live from the Bell House Theater, my name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I am Ryan Nicodemus, and together we are the Minimalists, live in Brooklyn! Woo! Oh Oh, man, that's that Brooklyn welcome I was looking for. Yeah. It's so great to be back in New York. We're doing three nights in New York this time around, but this is our very first time in Brooklyn. So thank you for being here with us tonight. So we have a special guest with us tonight. You know, we usually record a podcast. We're going to answer some of your questions. I've been told there's a microphone back there somewhere. What will happen is one person will start the line. They have to break the seal. And then people will cascade from the rafters and everywhere else to get to the mic. And so uh, whoever wants to ask the first question, we will get to that in a moment. But first, I'd like to introduce a special guest who will help us answer some questions, hopefully tonight. During our talk tonight, you you heard me and Ryan, we talked a little bit about contribution. And there's, uh, there's a saying that I believe to be true, and it's giving is living. And and. I realized that one of the things that was missing from sort of my past life, my especially like these solipsistic 20s, is I was living mostly for me and for my own desires. And I think that's important. I think personal development and growth and, and fulfilling your needs and even your wants, adding, having things that add value to your life and experiences that add value to your life, all those things are important. But it's not important if you can't also give. You can't contribute beyond yourself. And so one of the reasons Ryan and I do what we do is we hope to share a recipe. Um, for those of you who are dragged here tonight, that this, this isn't a cult. <laughs> Don't worry. 
No one's trying to convert you to minimalism. Uh, I don't know that that's even possible. But, but what, we're, what we're trying to do is simply share a recipe in hopes it adds value to your lives. It's a, a small way that we can contribute. But there are other ways that we try to contribute as well. Uh, within the last few years, um, we, we've done, been able to do some pretty cool things. We've built some elementary schools. We've funded high schools, um, clean water wells, and uh, we are helping the folks in, in Houston right now. We're, we're doing a charity event down there. We're also donating money and encouraging other people to donate to global giving. Uh, but, yeah, thank you. We, we like to contribute and also encourage other people to contribute, contribute but our, 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 our bit of contribution pales in comparison to our guest. He's someone who has been obsessed with water for the last decade. And um, I'm going to let him tell his story because he's going to do it so much better than me, but I'm, I'm grateful to, to share the stage with someone. We don't do interviews on our podcast, and we don't even have podcast guests ever, but occasionally we'll bring a friend on and... and uh, and have a little discussion with them. So please welcome Charity Waters, Scott Harrison. So, yeah, you got the memo. Yeah, man. <laughs> And uh, yeah, we're all, we're all, for those of you listening at home, we're, we're all dressed in black right now, except for my purple socks and Ryan's orange shoelaces. Oh, <laughs> uh, look nice. at you. You definitely got the memo. This is great. So you're obsessed with water. And I, I drank water today. What a coincidence. <laughs> but, but it's weird because I take it for granted, right? I, I, I turned on a faucet. In my hotel room. By the way, this is like our first legit tour. We've been on eight tours in seven years. And when it started, our first tour was in 2011. And we would go to a bookstore and a really great crowd would be like six people. I remember our fourth tour stop, we showed up in Knoxville, Tennessee, and no one was there. It was very humbling, except right as we were leaving, two people showed up. We've never been shut out. Uh, we had quite a few nights where there were two people. Yeah. And we were, uh, on the lucky nights, we would be able to sleep on a reader's floor or maybe their couch. Uh, one of us would be on the couch, one of us would be on the floor. On an unlucky night, we'd sleep at a rest stop in our tour bus, which is Ryan's Toyota Corolla. And, uh, and now this is like a legit tour because you all paid to get in. And so we have a hotel room <laughs> and, and I can go right to the faucet and I turn on the water and it just comes out and I'm able to drink it. But n that's not the case all over the world. And so can you talk to me a little bit about other people's lack of this thing that we take for granted? Yeah, sure. Uh, hey everybody, uh, it's great to be here. It's great to share a little bit of our story. Um, yeah, for, so for 10 years now, we've been working on trying to bring clean drinking water to everyone on earth. Uh, and a tenth of the world doesn't have the same opportunity that you had today and, and really every day. So about 660 million people, uh, because of where they're born, are drinking dirty water every single day that could kill them. Uh, and often does kill them and their, their children. So. Uh, it's, a, it's a big problem. Uh, water is this interesting thing that touches so many aspects of life that you don't think about until you don't have. And it's funny, people tweet at Charity Water all the time when their water gets shut off. It's like the number one, oh, my, my, you know, my doorman building had no water today. Wait, they're, not of you, they're not like asking you to hashtag. fix it, right? They don't want you to fix the water No, problem. no, but okay. it's, it's one of those things that on, you just never think about right. until that one day that it's, it's turned off in your building for like an hour and a half. Uh. And oh my gosh, what are you going to do? Right. So, so we, we've worked in, I mean, I'll just give you a, a, a sense of, of how bad it is if you don't have water. So we work in 24 countries around the world. Uh, I've, I've now been to 66 countries, you know, doing this work and, and other, and, and uh, one of the places we work is in Ethiopia. So uh, the communities where we, we work, the people that we serve, the, it's the job of the girls and the women to get the water. So first of all, the men never get water. I don't care if we're in India, Bangladesh, Central and South America, Sub-Saharan Africa. The men at best are farming, at worst they're drinking, 
And it's the job of the wives, you know, the women and the girls, to go and get the water. After they're done getting the water, they have to get the firewood, they have to go cook. It's a, there's a lot of extra uh, activities there. But the women are spending often up to eight hours every day walking back and forth for the water. And they're walking to sources like ponds, swamps, rivers, you know, uh, contaminated sources that we wouldn't let our animals drink from. Um, just to give you, you know, a sense of, of one of these villages, I was living in a village in Ethiopia uh, a couple years ago where a 13-year-old girl had been walking for water every single day. She, had a, uh, she carried a heavy clay pot on her back. So imagine 60 pounds of water, about 40 pounds of water, 20 pounds for the clay pot. And one day after her eight-hour round-trip walk, so it's about three out, and then you have to fill up your water, and then it's heavy, so it's a little slower back. Before she gets home, she slips and falls. So she breaks her clay pot, she spills all the water, and she doesn't go back and get more water. She ties a noose around her neck, she climbs a tree, and she hangs herself. So the elders of the village are walking by, and they find this 13-year-old girl's body swinging from a tree. And uh, I live in this village. Uh, the, the, the crazy thing was that nothing changed after her death. <laughs> All the women just continued going to the same source, continued walking eight hours, uh, walking past this tree that had claimed the life of, of this young girl. And uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's really that extreme. You know, the, the walk, the, the health, you know, 52% of all disease throughout the developing world is caused by bad water and lack of toilets. So half of the people that are sick don't need to be sick if they just had this basic need met. How, and again, how, you know, we're, 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 we're born into the privilege of having water uh, and having, being able to take long showers. So how did you stumble into this? What, 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 what made you passionate about, of all the things you can do in terms of contribution, I mean, this, this, this seems, it, it is so necessary, but, but what, what was the path for you to get there? Well, it's funny, I'm sitting in the back with my wife listening to, to your stories. Mine is so similar. Uh, you know, I started chasing the American dream of more. Uh, I was born into a very conservative Christian family. Uh, my mom became an invalid when I was four. There was a carbon monoxide gas leak in our house. So I had this weird childhood with uh, sickness and illness, and I was an only child in a caregiver role. And then at 18, I just went freaking nuts, <laughs> moved to New York City, and became a club promoter. Uh, you know, I couldn't believe that you could actually get paid to drink alcohol for free in this city. <laughs> like, I mean, if you're gonna rebel, you might as well rebel in style. So I spent the next 10 years uh, filling up nightclubs with thousands of the right people, charging them, you know, $500 to buy a bottle of champagne that costs 50 and $20 a cocktail and the one-way glass and the velvet ropes and uh, trying to accumulate all the things that you see on TV that we saw you know, among our clients, the Rolex watch that I got, the BMW that I drove, the grand piano in my New York apartment, the, the girlfriend who was on the cover of magazines, the, uh, the Labrador Retriever. I mean, you, you go step by step. And, it's you know, almost like it was connecting, it was, it was pain by numbers for consumerism, right? Like, for you, sure. You that, read the magazine from cover to cover, and you're like, I'll take that one, and that one, and that, and that. And, uh, yeah, and, and then, of it course, was, you were happy then, right? It was miserable. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, again, you know, I, I resonated with so much of what you were saying earlier. It looked great on the outside. So people looking from the outside, like, wow, this dude parties for a living. Like, we worked three nights a week. We flew around the world to Fashion Week. You know, we jumped in the back of, you know, cars with drivers, and we were taken around to fancy dinners. And, but, you know, somewhere around noon, you know, over a plate of cocaine, I mean, it was pretty dark. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the dinner at 10, the club at 12, after hours at 5, and I just remember, I remember this once on Houston Street, uh, it was around noon, and I was trying to come down from the whole night out, and I looked out the window, and people were on their lunch break. Like, people had been, you know, they'd gone to work <laughs> that day. They were going to lunch, and I was going to try to go to bed, uh, wake up at 6, 7 p.m., and then do it all over again. So, you know, I came to my senses. I was, uh, I was 28. Uh, I was in a vacation in South America, and I just had this, this moment of reflection, uh, realizing that I was spiritually bankrupt. I was morally bankrupt. Uh, I'd come, I'd really betrayed the, the spiritual and moral heritage of my youth. And uh, if I continued down this path, 
as a selfish, hedonistic sycophant that I would leave no meaningful legacy. You know, my tombstone would read, here lies Scott Harrison who got 10 million people wasted. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, yeah. I realize if I made it to 40, I would look 100. <laughs> And there was a good chance I wouldn't make it to 40. I mean, people were dying like crazy. You know, we would take the wrong thing by accident. And uh, it was a really destructive lifestyle. So, you know, I start, start to uh, re-explore uh, a very lost faith. And I think in a different way as an adult, you know, it wasn't force-fed to me. And I become really interested in the idea of service and service to others. And you know, I ask this question, what would the exact opposite of my life look like? What would it look like instead of, you know, getting drunk every night and, and trying to accumulate more things, you know, uh, more, uh, more money, more status, more fame, you know, better parties? What would it look like to, to try and use my time and talent and energy in the service of others? So I'm a pretty radical guy. I sold everything. Uh, my, my kind of clutter, declutter story, I put up 2,000 DVDs on eBay. And they were worth something, by the way, 14 years ago. And in a single lot, I just purged my life. And um, I began to apply to the famous humanitarian organizations in the world. Uh, you know, the, the great nightclub promoter is now ready for humanitarian service. So they all turned me down. Like, <laughs> literally, I'm denied by every single organization because, of course, they're serious people doing serious work in Africa. And, like, I'm some drunk in New York City. Um, and, uh, you know, finally one organization writes me back and says, if I'm willing to pay them $500 a month, I can volunteer. <laughs> and that's called a scam where I come from. <laughs> and I have to go live in Liberia, post-war Liberia. So this is a country I'd never even heard of before. Uh, they had just come out of a 14-year civil war led by Charles Taylor and child soldiers. And uh, so I'm like, here are my credit card details. You know, when does this start? And they said, three weeks. Wow. So, so my whole life changed in an instant as I joined this humanitarian mission of medical doctors and surgeons who would uh, give up their vacation time effectively and fly to Liberia and operate on people who had no access to medical care, people who couldn't afford procedures. And I wound up um, dedicating a year that turned into two. And among all the things that I saw uh, living in a leprosy colony, seeing you know, facial tumors and flesh-eating disease and uh, people who'd been burned uh, by rebels during the war, crazy, crazy things. I, I, I saw people drinking from swamps and I just had never seen a child drink you know, green viscous water before. I was selling bottles of water, of Voss water specifically, in nightclubs for $10. To people who would come in, they'd order 20 and not even open them. It was just a, a show of status. So I just couldn't believe that you know, there was this extremity, uh, this, this huge wide gap between a tenth of the world just born into uh, these situations, not born into the middle class privilege that I was, and uh, that I could use some of the things I'd learned promoting nightclubs and you know, telling uh, the wrong story, perhaps, to, to maybe tell a redemptive story that would actually help people. You know, I think we don't think about it. I mean, even though I grew up really poor, like dirt poor, food stamps, government assistance, I never thought about water even. You know, it, we, we thought about a lot and we struggled a lot, but we certainly didn't struggle with water. And so I think most of us, we, we, don't, even, we don't even think about it. it, it it's such a luxury to, to not even think about it. So um, we're, 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 we try to find different projects that Ryan and I can contribute to. And we, we started contributing to Charity Water on a monthly basis personally, but we want to hopefully inspire our audience and people in the, in the audience who can afford to contribute a small amount um, to do that as well. If you feel compelled, if you're like, I would re really like to help some people um, get access to, to clean water, uh, Scott and his whole team have, have made a a short film. It's actually a relatively long film. Um, uh, and uh, if you go to Charity it's Water... 19 minutes, which is like forever today. <laughs> on the internet, right? It's like, can you get it on Vine? <laughs> but uh, it's, it's a really compelling film. And so if you go to charitywater.org slash the minimalists, you can contribute whatever you want. And I'll tell you one thing that I've done recently, just within the last year, is I've started to automate my giving to make it, and, and Charity Water isn't the only place I contribute to. Uh, there are plenty of other great places. I go to givewell.org and the Against Malaria Foundation, but Charity Water is one of the places where I've automated and, and I give a small amount every single month uh, because I know that 
the, what they're doing with their money. And can you talk just a little bit before we d- dive into some questions, and hopefully you'll stick around uh, for some questions. Can you talk about the, the charity water model? Because yeah. um, the money that is donated isn't just for, isn't for administrative costs. Yeah. So I'll take you back 10 years. Uh, so th- this would be my life's mission, would be to try to create a day on earth when everyone had clean water to drink. And you know, we were 660 million people away from that day. Uh, as I started talking to my friends, you know, I was 30, I was naive, uh, I hadn't come out of the charitable sector, or um, I really wasn't influenced by the trappings of the big kind of bureaucratic institutions. So I started talking to my friends and I realized there's this huge distrust. None of my friends trust charities. At the end of the day, uh, you know, they're asking questions like, where does the money go? How much of my money is actually going to reach people? You know, is it going to get there at all? Uh, and I, I started to see the data behind this. Uh, you know, you guys know America is one of the most generous countries in the world. 42% of Americans distrust charities. So almost half the eligible givers in the country don't trust the system. You know, and, and they you know, we, we all have one scandal we can probably remember. I remember for a period of time, Anderson Cooper used to like chase down the bad charity CEOs to their Mick mansion and they would slam the door and he's sitting there on the, you know, and all of America throws up their hands and say, that's why I don't give. I don't trust those crooks. Um, NYU did a recent study that polled Americans and found that 72% of Americans said they, they believe charities either waste money or badly waste money. So that was really the problem I was trying to solve, to help bring clean water to millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions. I thought we just needed a new model to win back that trust that had been betrayed, to take a disenchanted public, people who really wanted to be generous, they wanted to give, but didn't trust the system. So uh, we had a couple ideas in the beginning. I thought, what if we could give away 100% of every donation we ever received in perpetuity and only use it to directly fund water projects um, and, and be so extreme about protecting the integrity of the 100%, we'd even pay back credit card fees. So if you gave 100 bucks on your Amex and we actually received 97, somehow we would figure out how to make up the $3 difference and send all $100 to the field. So people said at the beginning, that's the stupidest thing they ever heard. Like, you know, because how you have you, to have How will you pay costs. for a staff? Like, how will you rent an office? How would you even pay for a flight to go to develop your water programs? And I just believe that we would be able to find a very small group of individuals, if we did it right, who would who'd be builders, who didn't want their name on a well. They didn't want their name on a water project. They would actually want to pay for the salaries, the unsexy stuff, the copiers, the toner, the insurance, the phone bill. Um, and that would be, we would basically make our lives double as hard because we'd have to start two organizations from scratch. We would have to fund them effectively separately. There, were, there are literally two bank accounts at Charity Water that are audited separately. And then we'd have to run them in per- perfect balance. But I just believe that, you know, people wouldn't be able to use that excuse. How much of my money goes? 100%. What's next? So then we, we said, well, now that the money's not fungible, uh, why don't we use technology to track it? Why don't we show people the photos and the GPS coordinates of every water project we build around the world? Let's put everything up on Google Maps, Google Earth. You know, let's build the first kind of hyper-transparent organization where we could track a $4 donation that a, a 10-year-old you know, got at a lemonade stand and say, your $4 wound up in this $11,221 water project in Malawi. And here are the people you shared it with. So we just, uh, you know, we, we built the movement on social media. We never direct mailed. You know, I mean, the thought of a charity buying your physical mailing addresses and then sending you paper just seems stupid to us. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I spoke at Twitter when there were 28 employees. And we became the first charity to get a million Twitter followers and the first charity to use Instagram and really just tried to build uh, a community and celebrate our supporters and the diversity of the community and what they were doing. Uh, And then we wanted to build a beautiful brand. You know, my wife is here tonight. She was the second employee at the organization. And uh, we had come across this quote in the New York Times by Nick Kristoff that said, toothpaste is peddled with far more sophistication than all the world's life-saving causes. Now, if you think about this, junk food companies can spend half a billion dollars marketing to us things that kill us and kill our children. 
But they're the most important causes that are saving people's lives, that are feeding people, that are giving them clean water, that are providing shelter, often have anemic brands. Uh, they, you know, they still send non-mobile optimized emails today. It drives me crazy. Like, you know, expecting us to, you know, scroll with her. Like, uh, hire a 22-year-old that does responsive design, you know? Like, <laughs> Uh, so, but th this, is, this is what you see. Where was, the, where was the Nike of charities? Where was the Apple? Where was the Virgin, the Tesla? You know, where were the charities that were inspiring people, that were creating imaginative experiences? And you know, so many charities just use guilt and shame, and they make people feel horrible about how much they have, and, and then say, you know, reach into your wallet. And nobody wants to wear the T-shirt of that charity. It may work. You may give money. So we just tried to basically you know, look at all the things that people were doing and say, what would the exact opposite look like? What would it look like to build a brand on imagination and hope and opportunity and invite people in to be a part of something amazing, invite people to be a part of a world where everyone has clean water, to, to create that legacy for their kids and their grandkids. Um, and then the most important thing was just not sending people that looked like me to Africa <laughs> to actually go do the work. Uh, and, and we'd see so many people um, send Westerners to Africa, India, Southeast Asia, and just not really understand the local context, not get things right. So our job would be to get people to care about this issue, get them to give generously, be great stewards of their money, but then the work would all be done by the locals. It would be sustainable and led by the locals. They would be the heroes. They would be the ones flying the flag, getting the credit. Um, you know, today we employ over 500 people in Ethiopia. There is not a single expat on the entire staff. So 500 Ethiopians are out there every single day using the money from, from you guys, from us, from this community, but they are turning it into clean water for their own people. So that was 10 years ago and, and you know, similar to you guys, you know, that first month, like a couple people came out and then a few more and a few more and it grew now to um, over a million people have given a quarter of a billion dollars to help 7.1 million people get clean water, so. And what's, what's different now? I mean, so, so I, I can tell you this. So if you go back, I'm 36 now. I remember you were, your charity was actually the first, and I've never talked to you about this, but your charity was the first charity that really compelled me to not just contribute, but inspire other people to contribute. So I donated my birthday. I've donated several birthdays since then. And as the minimalist, we've been able to raise tens of thousands of dollars to build several wells in, in Malawi. And, and we want to go But you have to come at some point and see them for yourselves. It'd be amazing. Yeah. I'd love to. Um, and, and, and so where, where I'm going now is I think that once I felt compelled to inspire other people, I feel like your, your mission has shifted recently as well. Is that true? Yeah, I mean, the birthdays, you know, you talked about, this was a thing for years and years, and, and this, this is, I think we're so values aligned here. We looked at the birthday and said, it's all about stuff. Like, we get so much crap for our birthdays that we don't want or need. Belts, ties, gift cards, just, it's this commercial materialism cycle. And people don't even have clean water. So what if we could redeem the birthday? What if we could turn it into a generous giving moment that is about others and not about ourselves? And we involve our friends and family in something amazing and providing clean water. So I thought kind of the sticky marketing idea would be to get people to ask for their age in dollars, right? So if you're six years old, you know kids with $6. It's lunch money. If you're 71 years old, you know people who can donate $71. So this, this movement took, out, took off, I mean, people now through fundraising campaigns have raised over $50 million, uh, helping almost 2 million people get clean water. And, and that idea, like you said, it spread. The, the average person that donates their birthday gets 15 people to give to their campaign. So you have these mini word of mouth movements, right? We're not spending the marketing dollars doing that and it just kind of organically began to spread. So that was great and that kind of you know, helped us you know, serve 7 million people in the first decade. As we turned 10, we realized, you know, the problem with the birthday is you only do one. Most people only do one. They'd actually take the idea and start doing it for other charities. So we'd see people do their second birthday for hunger, the third birthday for a justice issue. Um, but, but we kind of had to start over every single year. And, and uh, at our 10th anniversary, we said, look, let's, let's see if we can start building a new community of people who will stick by us month in, month out, giving what they can, as little as five bucks, some people are giving $30, which it costs to give one person clean water. Some people give $300 and give 10 people clean water. And um, you know, the average person now has 11 subscriptions that we benefit from. The Netflixes and Hulus and Dropboxes and HBOs and Showtimes and your magazines, your, your news. 
right? 11 subscriptions every month that we are getting the benefit. And we said, what if we could create a subscription where you get zero benefit, 100% is passed on to the poorest people in the world who are in need of clean water. And then we'll try to innovate and find ways to build community, to share stories of what five or $10 or $30 does every single month. So that's called The Spring. Uh, and it's, it's brand new, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a new community. We have about 10,000 people now giving from 80 different countries. And uh, that's, that's really, I think, the key to our success over the next 10 years and what makes you know, the next 10 years different than the first is, is building this community. Yeah, it's funny, when you sent that video, I remember watching it, and you talk, spoiler alert, so just a heads up on the video. But no, you talk about This how, is at minute 19, by the way, probably. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> but you talk about how your goal is to provide clean water to the entire world. And if, if it was anyone else, I'd say they were freaking nuts, man. But like, I, I really believe that you can do it, man. Because uh, the organization that you've been able to put together, the support, and um, I, yeah, I donated my, uh, donated my birthday too, and I was just blown away at like how people many people gave, wanted right? to get. People yeah. love the idea. Yeah, it's a, it's a really powerful idea. And, and so we're going to wait until um, the Tuesday after Black Friday. It's called Giving Tuesday to put this actual podcast out because that's, it. that's when you're in the middle of it. So back in my, my corporate days, I, I managed 150 retail stores, which is really ironic. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. But um, we planned all year, like literally, we started having weekly holiday shopping meetings, uh, holiday shopping season meetings in February. So we were planning for Black Friday. And then that has extended into that entire weekend being the busiest shopping weekend. And then of course, the following Monday is Cyber Monday. But then after that, we're like, we, we feel this like, this stench of consumerism. <laughs> we're sitting at our desk like, how do I absolve myself? And uh, so there's this day called Giving Tuesday. And so hopefully when this comes out, folks will go to charitywater.org slash the minimalist. You all can go there tonight if you wanted to and, um, and contribute whatever you contribute. We, we'd really appreciate it. I and mean, let's answer some questions tonight. You want to stick around, Scott? Cool, yeah. Thanks. First up. Yeah. Howdy, what's your name? Hi, I'm Crystal. Um, hey, Crystal, where are you from? I'm from Florida. I just moved to New York uh, about three weeks ago. Welcome. So thank God I found minimalism before. <laughs> Have you been to the East River? I live near it now, so I was forced to learn, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know what it was when I moved here a few weeks ago, so I can bond with you. Um, uh, I do have a question, but I would like to take the opportunity to thank you both because you have added value to my life, I could take an hour. I wish I had the time to tell you the domino effect it added to the value with my relationship with my husband and my daughter. It really does domino. So anyway, sorry. <laughs> By the way, my husband was on board when he saw that min minimalism included a hair dryer because that is important to him. Well, that's one of the key points to being a minimalist. You have yeah. to have great hair. <laughs> Less stuff, more hair. That's my pithy yeah. answer. Next question. No. Oh, wait, she didn't ask. Thank me. you so much for that. Um, I just got to tell you, like, every time I hear that, like, it feels the same every single time. Meaning, you know, if we wrote three books and came out with a documentary and it was just you who got something out of it, like, that, that means the world to me. So, yeah, thank you very much. It's, it's our pleasure to do that. Thank you. Um, so because of you guys, we did start following um, other people. I follow Rebecca and Minimal Wellness. If you guys have not done that, she is beyond the, mo the best thing you could follow for nutrition and wellness. It's amazing. She's the best. So my daughter, I have a seven-year-old, and she has an affinity for kids with curly hair because she doesn't have that. So she's loves seeing pictures of, is it um, Hurricane Ella? That you <laughs> <laughs> That's about right. Yeah, yeah. So, That's what a Twitter, Twitter handle should have been. I sure, so my four-year-old has a Twitter account, and it's really just our way of, we don't have a scrapbook for her, so it's like my online scrapbook. It's just all the crazy shit that Ella says. As a four-year-old, it's at Ella Sandwich, for those of you on, on Twitter. Uh, yeah, it was going to be Hurricane Ella, but that seems inappropriate this week. <laughs> oh, right. Sorry, too soon. <laughs> too soon, Josh. <laughs> well, anyway, we started, we actually found the minimalism game by following Rebecca and Ella when she started joining her. And so we started doing that and posting the pictures. 
we were in the process of moving and we're stopping and go, oh, okay, well, this will be day five. And so we took those pictures and I was like, you know what, in the spirit of minimalism, we're going to just like get all this stuff out of here. That's enough with the pictures and the posting. So we were, I was like, let's just get all this stuff together. And then I realized, which she was on board and loved doing it. And then I saw all of her dolls, everything was all in this trash bag. Yeah. And I was like, wait, whoa, 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 you know, wait a second. And I thought she so got it, but she was like, well, here, now this is part of, this is what you like, you want me to do this. And then, you know, my birthday and Christmas are coming and we can replace these things. So (laughs) honestly, our birthday is 10 days before Christmas and, you know, she gets it as much as I think she can, but I I don't want to ruin those things, but I also want to direct her on the right path, you know, and encourage, you know, the... The reasons and why, and I just wanted help with how to do that, especially around Christmas time, and you know, taking away, don't want to take away the joy of like the getting or the you know, mm-hmm. the grandmothers from giving, and so. So, so you, your question revolves around not ruining a child's childhood <laughs> by <laughs> depriving them. Yeah, could you just them. fix that for me? Yeah. <laughs> uh, man, I, I can tell you this: that that I mean, Ella has such a great life, and she knows that she does, and I think. Part of it has to do with the habits that we're instilling. I can tell her something till I'm blue in the face, but really it comes from my own behaviors. I notice that when she is uh, doing something I dislike, like eating food on her plate with her hands instead of using a fork, it's because she just saw me like pull a piece of broccoli off of her mom's plate with my own hand. And uh, if I want her to uh, be her best self, I better be my best self. And, and part of that has to be with, in terms of living with less, it's less stuff, but it's more of everything else. It's more time with her. It's more experiences. It's uh, more contentment. It's, it's more giving and showing her, you know, whenever she's ready to get rid of a toy now, you know, she says to me, I want to, I want to donate this so some other kid can play with it. So she understands what it means to let go of the thing. It just doesn't end up in this nebulous void. She realizes that someone else is going to play with it. By the way, some of her toys are used, so she realizes that some other kid gave it up and and instilling that habit. And and, and our kids, they don't don't feel deprived. Uh, By the way, like... uh, the things she really loves are, are the silliest things. I can buy her the nicest, shiniest toy, but she'll play with a broken balloon and pretend it's yeah. something amazing. So uh, we don't get to determine what they find value in. Yeah. yeah I, uh, <clears throat> so Chris, I'm kidding. <laughs> so Scott, um, the, the, one, the, one thing I, the one thing I know about, about kids is that they love to contribute. They love to help. And, and given an opportunity to, just like with your daughter, she's like, okay, here's all my stuff, because kids love to help. I know you've got some really awesome stories about some kids who have contributed to Charity Water. Um, do you maybe want to share one or two, like the best success story? Yeah, I mean, I can share a couple. I mean, we've had the, the, the lemonade stands. I would just say exposing, exposing her young to different issues uh, we're just we're so surprised at the capacity kids have at a young age to understand their depth of compassion and empathy, uh, and you know f- for us we'll we'll look at some injustice in the world and you know we're so preconditioned to be used to it, and you know kids are like not on my watch what can I do about this? <laughs> um, I mean you know there was um, there was a little girl named Riley. Goodfellow in Orange County, and she started uh, eating, she went on a rice and beans fast for a month. She said, I'm only eating rice and beans, and I'm going to try and raise money. Uh, And she raised $15,000, and her mom sent us in this picture, and it was just, it was a picture of her holding a piece of paper, a bunch of pieces of paper taped together with a bunch of little lines. And, you know, we wrote her mom back and said, you know, what's up with the picture? And she said, well, my, my daughter went on your website and saw that 4,500 kids die every day of bad water. And she asked me for paper and pen, and she started to write 4,500 lines because she said she wanted to feel it. And it took her two days wow. to finish. Um, there, was, there was another story, um, an eight-year-old girl in Seattle named Rachel Beckwith who had given up her birthday and she set a goal of raising 300 bucks to help 10 people get clean water. And right before, she was an extraordinary girl already. The year before, she had cut her hair off and donated it to Locks of Love because she just didn't understand, you know, why 
kids would suffer with cancer and you know why their hair would fall out so if her hair could help someone else then you know that was better than her having it so she then comes across charity water see some of the videos on our website and says i can't believe the kids don't have clean water so she donates her birthday she gives up all the gifts she refuses to have a birthday party she raises 220 dollars so she falls a little shy of her goal and she tells her mom that she's going to try harder the next year uh, Right after her birthday, she's killed in a car crash. There was a 20-car pileup, uh, a tractor trailer uh, had lost control. Her mom was driving, her sister was in the front, and she was in the back seat, and she was the only fatality. And her mom uh, contacts our office and says, you know, my daughter's last wish was for kids she'd never met to get clean water. Uh, we'd like to reopen her campaign and encourage everyone to donate $9 in her honor. So this starts, the story of Rachel starts spreading, as you'd imagine, through her church community, through the Seattle community, starts spreading around the country, the New York Times gets a hold of it, the morning show starts spreading to Europe, starts spreading to Africa, and people in Africa start donating $9 for a girl in Seattle who cared about them getting clean water more than the stuff that we would expect her. She wound up raising $1.3 million. Over 60,000 complete strangers. They lay $9 down in her honor, uh, inspired by the, the depth of compassion, you know, the vision of, a, of an eight-year-old girl to consider others more important than her stuff and the things. Um, this happened five years ago, and uh, we got to actually take the family on the one-year anniversary of her death to Ethiopia to visit um, village after village after village after village that had clean water. Um, they got to see thousands and thousands of people and meet thousands of people who had clean water because of Rachel. And the cool thing is now, five years later, um, we just kind of looked at that data set. And so many of the 60,000 strangers that gave to her campaign were inspired by her. They started giving up their birthdays. They raised another $2 million. So Rachel has now directly impacted over 100,000 lives from an idea of helping 10. So I, I think the kids are the future. They, they understand it. You know, and these, these stories, uh, they inspire people. They, they, you know, to end on a happier note, there was a girl in Vancouver that just did 12 lemonade stands for Charity Water. And one of them in the complete rain, she would not come in, even though it was pouring rain. And at her last lemonade stand, she convinces a local band to perform on the sidewalk next to her lemonade stand <laughs> to attract more buyers. And she's now, she's now at $5,600 of lemonade. So, you know, kids are the future. I would say expose your kids. Don't, you know, uh, they, can, they can handle this stuff younger than we think. And they'll challenge us. You know, whether it's with the, the concepts and the values that you guys are talking about, if it's uh, humanitarian issues, you know, we can learn from children. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Right, we're going to do one more question before we move on to the lightning round. So, so sit tight. If you're back there, we'll do, we'll do at least three lightning round questions as well. Howdy, what's your name? Where are you from? Uh, and what's your I'm question? In, Hopefully in that order. Uh, yeah, well, my name is Mark, and hey, Mark. Um, I'm from here in New York. And um, I'm here with my, my wife, and we, who didn't drag me here, actually. We, we <laughs> came very happily. We're both getting so much out I'm of glad you weren't drugged. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> neither, neither dragged nor drugged. And we're, we're both getting so much out of, out of your message and your podcast. And also our, our nine-year-old boy uh, who can't come here tonight because this is 21 and over. So, so we're coming tomorrow to Philly. Uh, my, oh, and, wow. Um, and uh, also, I wanted to say uh, one, another reason we're here tonight is we decided, we decided this is the perfect way to celebrate the new year, uh, this being the Jewish New Year, so happy new year to all. Mm. And um, so uh, I had a question, I'm not saying what, what I do, but what my passion is, which is also what I do. Uh, I, um, I'm a musician, and I've, uh, uh, I'm a violinist. I've been on tour. And looking at where you've come from and where you are now, um, you know, being in a place with, with 12 uh, pe people listening and now uh, hundreds, and in some places I think probably thousands, then um, do you find that as much as you're passionate about what you do, that it is 
more stressful? And if so, what do you do about that? Or do you just say, well, I'm passionate about it, and so I can handle the stress? Yeah, no, I, I have a little like mentoring side hustle that I do, and I have some, some mentees. And a lot of them, the first meeting we have, um, I don't want to say a lot, some, they'll say, I really like what you do, man. I, I love how you know you get your own thing going on. You work for yourself. I want to do that. I want to live your life. And I'm like, no, you probably don't want to live my life. <laughs> <laughs> like I had to leave my my partner Mariah for uh, I mean for all intents and purposes ten months in 2014, so Josh and I could get on the road uh, and, and go on that 100 city tour. Um, our flight back from uh, Perth, Australia to Missoula, Montana, which surprisingly, you can't get that many direct, direct flights to <laughs> Missoula, Montana. It was something like 42 hours. It was, oh, and I had food poisoning on the plane. It was, it was, um, it was, uh, it was an interesting situation. Very, very grueling. And I, um, the one th- like, anytime I get um, a little irritated on a plane, I have to like remind, I, I don't know uh, if, if you guys have heard the Louis C.K. bit of like, my ass is flying at 500 miles an hour. This is pretty awesome. There's really no reason to be upset right now. And then when I had food poisoning, I'm like, and I get to go home and see a doctor. Like, no problem. I'll get this taken care of. Um, what I'm getting at is, is that Josh and I, we are living the dream. I love it. But the catch is that living the dream, it takes a lot of hard work. There's no doubt about it. Now, I think that there is a... Um, you know, there is this idiom that, that we're raised with, especially in, in, in Western culture of, you know, if, if you find what you love to do, you'll never work again a day in your life. <laughs> Bullshit. <laughs> I mean, at, at <laughs> when it all comes down to it, uh, that might be true for some, uh, fewer than some, um, but uh, that, is, that is probably not the right expectation for people to have. So, to answer your question, yes, it's hard work, man. It is a lot of hard work. And, uh, you know, we just, Josh and I moved recently. Mariah would be here with me. Um, but, you know, she was at home, like, cleaning our place and getting everything uh, in order. And thank God that I have a supportive partner, too, that totally supports me in, in doing this work. So for me, it's, you know, when it comes down to the hard work that I put in, what I look at is, like, what am I getting out of it? What am I giving out of it? And if it is a net positive, then for me, like, it makes it worth it. And then having uh, people around me, surrounding myself with people who are incredibly supportive and who, who makes the work fun, uh, that, that is what makes it all worthwhile. But, yeah, I don't ever look in the mirror and think, oh, my God, like, dude, you can't do this anymore. Like, I don't, I haven't, if I ever do come to that, if I'm ever, if I'm ever at the, you know, at the end of the show, we do the, we do the hug line. And if I'm ever at that hug line and I'm like, Damn, there are too many people in this hug line. <laughs> I got I to gotta get to sleep. I do not want to be here. Like, this is miserable. If I ever get to that point, then I won't do it. And, and, and that's what I would say about anyone out there who is, you know, cultivating a passion or, or working, uh, their, their passion is their work. Is, is it a net positive? And if there's something that is glaring to say, hey, I don't want to do this anymore, then that is, uh, for me, it would be something, it would be a sign for me of something internal saying, hey, dude, maybe you shouldn't do this anymore. Maybe there is something else you need to move on to do. Yeah, I think it's a different kind of stress. It's, I had problems before, for sure. I had problems growing up poor. I had problems when I was making great money in my 20s. And I still have problems today, but they're better problems. And, and that's really what I strive for, is, is continuing to improve upon those. I'm not going to live a perfect life, but it's more ideal. And anytime anything feels out of whack, I just have to go back and look at my values and say, are my actions right now in line with, with my values? And, and whenever I feel some sort of discontent or stress or whatever, usually it ha- has, to, has to do with me forsaking one of those, one of those values. Although I'd be interested, Scott, you, you, I mean, you're running an organization with 500 employees. And by the way, what you do it saves people's lives. So the obverse of that is what you don't do doesn't save their lives. And that's, uh, that's an incredible responsibility. Yeah. Uh, 
I, I would say, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Scott's like, oh, I never thought of it that way. <laughs> I mean, basically what I'm saying is if the people in here don't help, it's on you. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, we've been at it now uh, 11 years, and a lot of people will come up to us, and this is in a very small social entrepreneur's kind of field, and say, you know, wow, did you guys ever think you would be so successful? Like, did you ever think you could raise a quarter of a billion dollars? And, you know, uh, currently we're helping 2,800 people get clean water every single day of the year. So 20,000 people every single week get clean water for the first time in their lives. And I'm like, man, I, first of all, I thought we would be so much farther, honestly. Uh, Seven million people, I thought we'd be at 70 or 100 by now. Wow. Uh, the, you know, our ambition so far exceeds our ability, <laughs> which is frustrating. And I feel like now for 11 years, I've been pushing a boulder up the hill. I read Tipping Point. It didn't help. <laughs> you know? Like, literally, it's just, it gets harder and harder. And now the weight of responsibility, you know, we, we employ 1,500 locals, actually, around the world in 24 countries. And oh, wow. uh, the organization has to raise about a million dollars a week to continue serving you know, a million people and we want to raise more. So the, the pressure builds and builds and builds and it gets harder and harder. Um, I, yesterday I got off my 46th flight of the year. Uh, the year before my, my first son was born, I did 98 flights. And you know, we're flying coach, right? The organization has never bought a business class ticket in the history of, of Charity Water. So it's, it gets harder and harder and harder, more, more speeches, more meetings, more, uh, more travel to these countries. And um, I think that the, the life, uh, the, the one quote I came across of 10 years ago that's really been a driving force for me, it actually comes from an ancient uh, Jewish text. It's uh, Avot de Rabbi Natan, I think. Um, and it's, it's this amazing quote. It says, do not be afraid of work that has no end. I love that, right? Like, don't be afraid. Now, then it begs the question, what are you working for? All right, so if your work is in the service of others, if it's using your time and your talent and your money, you know, to alleviate suffering, to reach out, uh, to, to serve others, it will have no end, right? I, I'm so sick of hearing about charities putting themselves out of business. Like, if we... When we get everyone on earth access to clean water together as this huge global community trying to do this, you know, we're not going to go drop the mic and go work at Goldman Sachs, uh, right? We're going to turn everything we've learned over decades, our generous community of millions and millions of people on another issue, on another form of human suffering. Maybe it's hunger. Maybe it's shelter. Maybe we believe everyone should have a roof over their head and no one should go to bed hungry, but we're not just like... That's the pursuit. So it's a never-ending pursuit of, of service or selflessness. If, if, you know, I think all of us were kind of trapped in the, the never-ending pursuit of materialism, of more stuff, more status, uh, better cars, better, you know, whatever, more, more people to say nice things about our better job titles. As trophies. We, trophies. So I love that. Don't be afraid of work that has no end, but really ask yourself, what are you working towards? Yeah. Um, love it. Thanks for your question. Thank you. Thanks. All right, it is time for our lightning round. This is where we usually answer questions from social media, but you're here, so we'll answer your questions. Uh, let's do two light, lightning round questions, and we'll do one bonus round question or overtime question. We'll get to that in a sec. Um, so what we do is we try to give you a short, shareable, less than 140-character response, something pithy <laughs> that you can tweet. By the way, uh, Jessica uh, runs our social media. She is here taking pictures and live tweeting right from our account. We're at The Minimalists on Facebook and the Instagrams and the Twitters. So, ladies and gentlemen, Jessica Williams, yeah. wherever she is. <laughs> so you give us a regular question, we'll try to give you a pithy answer. And if we don't have something pithy, we'll ramble on until we get something pithy for you. What's okay. your name? My name is Frank. Hey, Frank. Originally from Brooklyn. Um, Welcome. So my question is, uh, well, currently I'm in a job where I just get up and go through the motions and got to pay the bills and render all that stuff. And thanks to my supportive boyfriend over here, uh, I'm trying to pursue my passions, which is creative writing. And currently in October coming up, I'm going to be taking some creative writing courses. So I think what I'm trying to say is, um, how do you get over that fear of trying to leave a safe job 
um, and go for what you're truly passionate about. I'm not going to just get up and go, but the idea of you know having a pension and having benefits and all that stuff to really pursue something that you feel amazing about. How did you guys really get over that and pass that? I think my tweetable answer is something like, <laughs> um, security is a misnomer. Yeah, I, I had the, the secure job where I was living paycheck to paycheck. And I was, I was you know, one dismissal away, or if the company was sold, I, I, I was two paychecks away. It's so about a month away from uh, danger, from emergency, right? We have a friend, his name is Rob Bell, and um, uh, uh, he, was, he was on our, our podcast recently, and he, he's, here's, here's, I'll, I'll steal his pithy answer. Uh, most emergencies aren't. Um, but, but we treat everything like it's an emergency these days, and thus... I think we, we tell ourselves that the path we're on is secure. Um, oh, here's my pithy answer for you. Uh, uh, I knew I'd get to it. I knew, uh, I knew we'd get there. Um, it is not the security blanket that brings one security. <laughs> it's good, man. Uh, uh, if I had to get... My, uh, the only thing I could think is, like, man, uh, living... Uh, living the lifestyle I was living and having to have the job to maintain that lifestyle, it was, it just felt like a really bad tornado, very bad hurricane. And the only, I guess my pithy answer would be, uh, <laughs> he's composing the draft. <laughs> um, to have a job that brings you security so you can live a life that you hate is never worth it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. You're on the hot seat, sir. No way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I, you can I'm, retweet I feel like something. I'm not the right person to ask uh, about that question. I mean, for me, it was obviously much more radical, uh, there was no security. I mean, nightclub promoters are not good at saving money. So if you were a <laughs> month away, like, I was like two days away. <laughs> uh, you know, I sold everything and made a little bit of money there. But, uh, I, I, you know, hearing you, they, uh, whoever talked earlier just saying that they, um, it was you, you, you know, being in a job you hate, like, that just makes it all cringe. You know, that's such a horrible... Uh, you know, doing something that you don't love uh, because it pays the bills, like you've got to find a way out. Um, and I love, you know, having a plan. Maybe don't just leave and, uh, you know, and then you're like on the street or, you know, but, but work, you know, take the classes, uh, go and, you know, earn some income on the side, find a way, you know, to that path. And it sounds like you know what that is. You want to write. Uh, you know, you want to find a way to be creative and, and turn that into the thing that you do for a living. So I would spend as much time uh, trying to get there, um, coming up with a plan, experimenting with things, and you know, making sure a few years from now you know, you're not in a job that's just paying the bills, so you're doing your thing on the side. You had the pithy answer in there. All right, you're going to help I, me. If I, so, so if I were to tweeze it out. Paraphrase. He, well, no, verbatim. You said, you said uh, if you're working a job you hate just to pay the bills, get out. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Have anyone seen the movie Get Out? I don't. Yeah. 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 So not not a spoiler, but I feel like you're in the sunken place right now, <laughs> and some of you will get that. Others yeah. will eventually. Thank well, you so awesome. much. If we Thank get you. Your information after. Thank you. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it. Make sure you come see me afterward and, and grab a hug. They're free and transferable. All right, we'll do one more lightning round question. Howdy, what's your name? Hi, um, Yvonne. I'm very hey, Yvonne. nervous. I'm um, very happy to be here. We're happy you're here. my supportive sister because I don't have a supportive... Give it up for the supportive sister! Yes. <laughs> um, and currently, we're both looking uh, for meaning. We're both struggling. Um, and we both have people in our lives who are not supportive. So the question is this, um, I want to pursue minimalism, I want to get on the track, I'm, I listen to everything, every podcast, and I just joined the Patreon page, even though I have to pay my bills, I can afford that. Um, so I'm very happy about that too, I'm proud of it. Um, so the question is, 
if I want to pursue minimalism, my husband does not. Um, and I know what you've said before, you have to be accepting of who that person is and try not to force them. Right. But I full-fledged want to go in. I think Valerie will too after tonight. So I know I <laughs> could get the support from her. But I live with him. That's, you know, the issue. It, so, it's simple when he's not... <laughs> when he's not home, you just pack up all his stuff. Uh, that's yeah, what I my, would, yes. <laughs> hang on, don't stand my mind was going to be simple. Just throw his stuff out. <laughs> But I do that. I do it. And I'm, now I'm not supposed to. I do do These it. guys will help you deal with the consequences. No, 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 no. I do Don't it. do that. Don't do that. Thank they, goodness Sean, podcast Sean is here. We have a good editor. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I have two words for you. House fire. <laughs> I've that said way, it many well, times. They'll never track it back to you. It's totally <laughs> right. fine. This podcast won't be sent out to a million people. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, so so uh, actually, it's, it's, it's weird. We'll get people come up to us in, uh, after our events, like really emotional and be like, like, my house just flooded or it just caught on fire. And I feel so relieved. Now, I'm not telling you to do that. In fact, I'm telling you not to, just to be clear. Um, um, but w what, what I am saying is they didn't realize that before the thing happened to, to them, right? And so what needs to happen to your husband isn't you forcing anything on him. Um, it's, it's, it's leading by example. It's showing the benefits. Now, the benefits may be different for him than they are for you, but some of the benefits are going to be shared. It's going to be sort of this Venn diagram of benefits and you know, happiness, contentment, uh, feeling lighter, having better you know, finances, more time, whatever those shared benefits are going to be. But then some of the benefits are going to be different for him, and you're going to have to show those, not tell him. And so I guess my pithy answer would be is... Uh, uh, Forced minimalism ain't minimalism. That's good. Indeed. Um, you know, when it comes to any relationship, I think especially romantic relationship, um, there, there are certain levels uh, to kind of get through. And you mentioned one, which was um, accepting. I, I think below acceptance is, is, is probably tolerance, which is kind of a, a weak virtue. It's like when I'm stuck in traffic in LA, everyone's tolerant. <laughs> they're not like necessarily happy, but they're tolerant and they'll let you over. Um, but then, I, you know, after that, I think you move to the acceptance. Um, and then it goes uh, to respect and then to the point where you appreciate the person. So it's not just accepting who your, who your husband is or him uh, accepting you. It's, it's about getting to that, that point of appreciation. What I'll say is that it is a two-way street. So for as much support and as much respect as you give your husband, it is something that uh, if he gives that back to you, it's going to help the relationship flourish. So um, I, I think my pithy answer would be uh, don't spend too much time investing in people who don't invest in you. And, and, and I'm not... I'm not telling you to get a divorce. <laughs> this, is not, this is not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, is that if you do work on those steps and you can get to that point where you can truly show them that you do respect them and you, that you do appreciate the differences and you kind of look at this minimalist journey as your own journey, I promise you, you will move him. Because the worst thing anyone can do, like think about someone who is, um, like I was raised a really hardcore Jehovah's Witness and, uh, which is basically just like a really strict Christian religion. And I remember I would get into an argument with, not even an argument, discussion, a very nice discussion. Argument is not the right word. Uh, with like a Seventh-day Adventist. And we would have the both, we, we both have the same thing in our mind of, oh, I'm going to convert this guy. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm going to convert this guy. And when I would get into those conversations, I never, ever, when, when, when they were trying to get me to their side, I never, ever budged an inch towards their side. If anything, I moved a foot back. I held on to my, to those values that, or those beliefs, I should say, that I had uh, even, even stronger. So yes, going into the forced minimalism, do not get rid of your husband's stuff because that's just going to make, that's just going to piss him off even more and make him step back. But the way that you can, the way that you can get someone to move forward is to respect them, love them, 
and appreciate them. Like that is what will help bring your husband over to your side. And you guys may never be on the same level when it comes to minimalism, but I promise you, if you can get to that appreciation point, you're going to have a very happy relationship. Okay, thank you. Thank you. you have anything pithy? Yes. You, want, you want to tie this up with a bow? Uh, how about did. this? You can quietly start without him. Mm. <laughs> That's good. That is so good. It's so true. Um, yeah, you don't have to go to him and be like, all right, husband, today we're going to start our minimalist journey. Yes, you can absolutely start quietly. That's, that's the best one out of the three, I think, actually. <laughs> Scott just steals the, uh, the round there. All right, y'all, quick interruption. If you want to listen to our bonus episode this week, as well as all of our past bonus episodes, head on over to theminimalists.com and click donate at the top of our website. Each week we publish The Minimalist's private podcast exclusively for our Patreon supporters. This private podcast shows up in your normal podcast feed like Apple Podcasts, Overcast, Google Play, or whatever podcast app you use. And it shows up right next to our normal weekly podcast you know, the one you're listening to right now. And being a Patreon supporter also gets you first access to the best tickets to all of our live events, as well as access to our monthly private live stream video, which is called Ask the Minimalists Anything. It's worth noting that none of this money goes to me or to Ryan. Instead, we're using your contributions to build a new podcast and film studio in Los Angeles so that we can create more meaningful audio and video creations. If you already support this podcast, thank you. I know that $2 often doesn't sound like a lot of money. I mean, it's less than a cup of coffee, but it is your support that keeps this podcast 100% advertisement free because advertisements suck. And if we can just get 2% of our audience to support this show, then we'll have enough funds to produce some amazing new creations. Your support is truly appreciated. All right, y'all, back to the regular show. All right, real quick, we'll, ra we'll have to wrap this up. They're going to kick us out of the theater. I really want to apologize to the folks who didn't get a chance to ask questions. Uh, I do want to thank a few people before, uh, before we get out of here. Um, we are on tour right now. We have a tour manager, a road manager, a podcast producer, podcast editor, book editor, all in one human being. <laughs> He's our operations manager. He's really the guy behind the minimalism. Ladies and gentlemen, hiding in the shadows in the back, podcast Sean. Yeah. Thank you, Sean. And um, I don't know if Jake is still hanging out around here. My guess is he is, but we've been hanging out with the folks from Nightline. They're, they're trying to, to get more attention on this, and hopefully we'll, via Nightline we'll be able to, to shed some more light on, on the charity water stuff as well. So, Jake, if you're here, thank you for helping us get the message into the eyes and ears of more people. Thank you so much. And Scott, I want to thank you for being here. I want to just acknowledge you and, and say thank you so much for what you do, man. You're making the world a better place, and I'm really grateful for that. <laughs> and uh, if you leave here with just one message, we hope it's this. Love people and use things, because the opposite never works. Yeah. Thanks, y'all. Thank you very much. All right, Ryan, before we backflip into these comments from our readers and, and readers, are they reading our podcast? I didn't know you could do a backflip. <laughs> I didn't know I could do a backflip. I didn't know I could read a podcast. <laughs> Kissed. What's a podcast? Oh, We're not going to read this. You know, that was a great, it was a great live event and we just now ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're good at that though i'd apologize but i'm not sorry i backflipped and hit my head on the uh, diving board apparently <laughs> anyway before we backflip into these these listener comments and tips my favorite part of the show uh we just want to say thanks to scott harrison and we hope that you all support charity water if you just have a few bucks five bucks you can donate to charity water it's a great cause they're doing some really great things charitywater.org slash the minimalist there's a, another way to contribute if you're going to be in the las vegas area in january uh, january 14th we're doing a charity event 100 percent of the profits 
uh, go to the uh, victims fund after this terrible mass shooting that happened. We wanted to find a way to give back there uh, locally. And so we decided to add one additional less is now tour stop there in Las Vegas. So it's a normal tour stop, but 100% of the profits go to the victims fund. It's the House of Blues on January 14th. That's a Sunday. It's a long holiday weekend. So hopefully you can make it out. That place seats a bunch of people. If we can fill it out up, we can raise a lot of money for all of the victims there. Yeah. You can find the ticket details over at uh, theminimalists.com. Oh, and uh, one more. Rem- oh, actually, a couple more cities we're going to. Uh, we're going to Milwaukee and Detroit. That ends the Less Is Now tour this year. So I think there's still some tickets available for both of those events, uh, Detroit and Milwaukee, theminimalists.com. And you can also go to that website because we're going to Australia and New Zealand next year. Those events are selling out quickly and they're huge theaters. So please get your tickets before you start tweeting us a month from now saying, hey, I waited too long. I can't get my tickets. I'm sorry. Like one, Once the seats are full, the seats are full. I, yeah. can't, I can't book a ticket for you to sit on someone else's lap. <laughs> <laughs> that's Laps, a different kind of show lap seats <laughs> <laughs> dot net oh my goodness someone someone write that down yeah someone write down that terrible idea sean um yeah, anyway we're gonna be so yeah we're going to new zealand australia we'll be in detroit milwaukee and vegas come on out and see us and one last reminder don't buy the bag that we just made you've probably heard us the last few weeks we, we created something called uh, the packed one it, it's the bag that you see in our documentary that we that we used for we still use uh, have used for the better part of a decade. The the one item I've gotten the most value from in the last decade is it's either that phone that I'm holding in my hand right now or that bag. Uh, but truth be told, like. It would be much harder to travel the way that we travel if I didn't have a bag that works really well for me. But here's the thing. It may not work well for you, and you probably don't need another bag. And especially if you can't afford to buy a bag, it's not that expensive, but if you can't afford it, we certainly encourage you not to buy it. Don't go into debt. Don't put it on a credit card that you can't pay off by the end of the month. It's not worth that. It's a great bag. We found a lot of value in it. That's why we started an Indiegogo campaign uh, just for the bag to see how many people really need the bag. But that word need is the key word here. If you if you don't need the bag, if you just want to consume it on impulse, then step back, think about it for a second, and see whether or not it really is for you. And the truth is, it's not for most people, and that's totally okay. But if you are excited about it, and you really want the bag, you can head on over to theminimalists.com slash bag. You can find the trailer there. You can find out more information and maybe some reason, more reasons. We'll write down some more reasons why you shouldn't buy this bag. <laughs> Man, if there was only like a, a two-minute meditation that people could go to. <laughs> that was last week. And listen to <laughs> yeah, before yeah. they purchase any new item that they bring into the light, that would be so helpful. Yeah, so if you're a Patreon supporter, then you have access to our, our two-minute anti-consumerism meditation, or you can find that meditation and the other Black Friday meditation that we did uh, for our friend Dan Harris, who is in our documentary. He has a great meditation app called 10% Happier, and he has a bunch of different meditations he releases on there. We just wanted to help him out. This is definitely not an ad for that. He doesn't pay us a penny uh, to to mention his podcast. Well, he has a great podcast as well, but yeah. or his app. But um, he's he's a good friend, and uh, he, I mean, his app is the best meditation app that we've ever used. So that's why we decided to help out. All right, y'all. Let's listen to these comments and tips from our backflipping listeners. <laughs> My name is Annabelle, and I'm calling from Munich, Germany. This message is for Leah from Montreal, who asked about reconciling minimalism and the desire to have a wedding. Leah, my friend, I've been you. The one thing I always wanted was a big and beautiful wedding. And once I got it, I didn't really want it anymore. I have the coolest husband in the world now, but our wedding wasn't exactly a walk in a field of ponies. We spent $15,000, which were our entire savings, plus $3,000 in credit card debt, just to be smothered for eight hours by a few hundred well-intentioned guests who, quote, absolutely needed a selfie with the bride. And it's not that we didn't stick to our list of priorities, or that we overspent on silly things, or that something in particular went wrong. We just couldn't possibly cram enough enjoyment into this day to call it the best day of our lives and justify the expense. There are industries that sell you stuff, and then there are industries that sell you an idea of who you're supposed to be as a person. So when you plan this ritual with your partner, think about the verb to love, not the noun bride. 
I'm sure you are more beautiful in PJs doing what you're passionate about than squeezed into a huge white gown doing what society expects you to do. Your family and your fiancé probably think so too. If all else fails and you must have a wedding in the classical sense of the word, I can share this one piece of advice. Slash your guest list in half. Be ruthless. You will have much more one-on-one -on -one time with the people you truly love. As for my hubby and me, we enjoyed the Wednesday afternoon field trip to City Hall, dressed in jeans with our two best friends, much more than the ginormous party the weekend after. Best of luck, darling. Hi, this is Roxana from Austin, Texas. I wanted to follow up with a high school student that had called um, earlier in one of the podcasts about not going into debt for college and actually uh, earning 10000 a year during high school. Well, I wanted to give her an advice. I graduated without any debt um, in college, and she doesn't actually have to earn all of the money while she's in college. What you can do is earn part of the money, but then along the way, there's the summers um, where you're off, and you have you get internships. And I know she was going to go into dental hygiene, but she doesn't have to take an internship or a job in one of those, that, and she can go into an internship or a career that would pay her well. And I just want to encourage her to keep doing what she's doing, but there is time while you're in college to actually also earn that money. You don't have to have all the money before you get there. And that doesn't mean that you have to take out the money in loans. It just means that you can also work and earn while you're in college. So good luck. I hope everything goes well for her. Hi, my name is Michelle, and I'm calling to answer a question asked on episode 97, Side Hustle, from Jean from Sacramento. She mentioned moving into a tiny house and the accoutrements that come along with the life-sustaining hobby of cooking. And she asked, when you cook, how long does it take you and what do you make? In our family, my husband and I range from cooking for 20 minutes to hours and even days for some of the recipes. And I really wanted to call because my husband and I dream of having a tiny house and someday with half of it being the kitchen. So I had several recommendations for Jean. First was uh, kitchen supplies. Alton Brown's book, Gear for Your Kitchen, was really helpful for me. Um, he's very critical of what he refers to as unitaskers or tools that only do one job. Second is a subscription to America's Test Kitchen online. If you're shopping for stuff, they have really helpful reviews and they've tested everything very thoroughly. Um, then for minimalist cooking, the Brothers Green Eats on YouTube has brief, well-made videos and in the early episodes, they're cooking in a small apartment kitchen, so that may be helpful to you. Lastly, I would advise considering how everything will work together. Uh, for example, my husband has been pining after an induction cooktop. If we were getting one for a tiny house, I would keep our pressure cooker and eliminate our rice cooker. Um, maybe invest in a pan that would nest in the pressure cooker for storage. If we were instead investing in an in Instapot or something similar, then I'd have a really different plan. I maybe want a single gas burner in addition. Um, so I hope for you everything is going well and you're able to make decisions that help you downsize while keeping your choices on things that you value. Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing that's just feeding your greed Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it Every little thing that you gotta have Every little thing that you gotta have You gotta reach for and you gotta grab Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it So take your eyes away Or take 